heavy stuff that Paul is preaching. The way he talks about foolishness and weakness and strength is a little off-putting to me. Is it the case that we are always foolish? Is it the case that preaching is foolish? Obviously, he's using some irony there, showing that by the standards of the society that he is in, according to the worldview of those in Corinth, there is foolishness in preaching the cross. How many of you know what preaching the cross is? You can see why it might be considered foolishness, right? So in this, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest scandals about Jesus is his death, right? He died. He was supposed to be the Messiah, the anointed of Israel, the person who was to redeem Israel out of occupation and restore it to its glory. Did that happen? Apparently not. He was killed on a cross. Right? So to the Greeks, who are not part of that world, they say, okay, so you were worshiping this guy who lived his life and then died. That's their worldview. Where is the wisdom in this? This is foolish. To the Jews, who say, well, he obviously did not succeed in his task. He did not redeem Israel. Israel is not a nation. It is still under occupation. And now you're saying that he is actually God? This is a scandal. That is their worldview. And Paul is saying, you need to reach beyond that worldview you are in. You need to see beyond your own perspective. And we talked about this on Wednesday night, for those of you who were at Bible study. This is what Marcus Borg and N.T. Wright are talking about. You are aware of your limitations. And God takes it a step, Paul takes it a step further to say, not only be aware of your own limitations, but be aware of the way that God can transcend them. In other words, don't be so arrogant as to think that you have all the answers. Don't be so proud of your human knowledge or so proud in how you've interpreted the scriptures that you close your mind off to the miracles God works. And so naturally, when I was reading this, I thought of Game of Thrones. Have any of you seen Game of Thrones? I know one person has, so someone's lying. No one? No one watches Game of Thrones? Ah, okay, Doug, you're with me too. Anyone read Game of Thrones? They're fantasy. Scott, thank you. Everyone's outing themselves, Jennifer. So a few of you do. How many of you have heard of this thing, a Game of Thrones? More? Thank you. Good. Uh, I understand we don't have HBO and don't always have sort of the wherewithal to get these DVDs or the stomach to put up with the violence um, in, in this particular series. But for all of you who don't know very much about it, it is basically a fantasy recreation of the War of the Roses in England. Are you familiar with that? Is it really confusing? Do you know anything about it? Okay, now you're on the same level as everyone who reads Game of Thrones. Okay. So it's like that only with dragons. And it's a fascinating series of books that's been written over about the last 30 years by this guy, George R.R. R. Martin, who is well known for two things in his writing. One is that all of his books, and we're talking about 3,000 pages or 4,000 pages of writing at this point of, of this series, is written from a perspective, a first-person narration. You know, you see this every once in a while. If you claw back to your 10th grade English class, you know, first person, limited perspective narrator. It's someone's point of view. What's interesting about Martin is that he's got about 75 of these that you need to keep track of, which is why almost no one actually stays through it more than one or two books. But it's, important. it's an important lesson for us because we read these and we have a perspective, and as we're in someone's head, what happens? We start to empathize with them and we start to like them. And we know it's a fantasy novel, right? It's this book that follows traditions. And so you like these characters. They're your protagonist. They're the hero. And in the first book especially, your hero's up in the north. He is noble and he is good. He's going down to sort things out in the south where he meets with his antagonists. And we all know how this is going to end. 
We look at this and we say, well, maybe he's a little naive for all his nobility. But he's going to come to the south and redeem the nation. He's going to fix all the chaos in Westeros and will go into a new level of peace and prosperity. And we keep on believing that right up until the moment that George R.R. R. Martin reveals the other thing he is notorious for, which is killing all of your favorite characters. So here's this guy that we expected to redeem the nation who winds up dead. Evil seems to have triumphed. And at that stage, half of the original readers swore never to read another book again. And then five years passed and they, you know, gave up. So that's what he does. So he goes from this worldview that we all have when we come into it of a typical fantasy story, of a typical narrative, that here's this person that's going to redeem the world he is in into one where we are much more cynical, where we understand that all humans have flaws, that everyone has a flaw that will be their undoing. In this case, he was naive. He did not know how politics worked in the South, so he did not interpret people's actions correctly. In other cases, people believe that their uh, soldiers who were sworn to them would be with them no matter what, even if they were pressed really hard we see all of these things happen, so we now know that even though we have a limited view, even though we only have inside the head of these characters, we know that the world does not work the way that we want it to, and it all comes down to life and death. And that's where we are for five books or so, and five seasons of this show. Every time there's someone new that we really love, and every time they die in some horrific and unredeemable way. And so the last season when we meet Oberyn Martell, the Red Viper of Dorne, who is charming and handsome and funny, we all start to cry inside knowing what's going to happen. He has shown up in the story with one mission. And he's very open about his mission. It is to redeem the wrongs that were done to his family. He's not there to save the kingdom. He doesn't care. He is there on another mission. And he's very focused on it in his charming way. And the characters we like, like him. And the characters we hate, hate him. And it's great. Until he winds up in a battle with the one unidimensional character in all of Game of Thrones. The Mountain. Gregor Clegane played by the strongest man in Iceland in the this, in this series. A giant man who is totally evil. No redeeming qualities whatsoever. I will not, in a church, in Sunday morning worship where there are children, go into his many sins. So we have this guy that we love and this guy that is evil. Like, it's going to happen again. But hope beyond hope. Oberyn Martell manages seemingly to defeat the mountain who is lying on his back in the arena and we all say maybe this time it'll be different maybe maybe there'll be that moment of transcendence at which point he starts to prance around and make a big speech turning his back in the manner of all professional wrestlers in history on the giant man on the ground who's very dangerous and it ends how it ends and so we are depressed, and our view of Martin is confirmed. We were foolish to have hope that this time it would be different. We were foolish. And then the page turns, and we seem to have forgotten that Oberyn Martell didn't talk about what he was going to do after he gained victory over his enemy, specifically the mountain. He did not talk about that. He did not talk about all the things he was going to do in the future. Because he didn't care. And so unbeknownst to us, unbeknownst to the crowd, unbeknownst to the person whose life was hanging in the balance, Oberyn Martell had poisoned all of his weapons. Now this is not something I recommend we do. We're in a different world here. 
But let us remember that this is not a man that he was fighting. This was the avatar of evil. And so what Oberon Martell did was say, in death, I will still have victory. In death, I will not have defeat. And all of us, well, all of us, who are reading along or who are watching the series, fell into the same trap that those Christians in Corinth had, burned by the idea that there was going to be someone redeeming the nation, we had become cynical and stopped looking around for what might be going on. We had closed our eyes and ears to the possibility that we were not looking at the same landscape as God was. Or in this case, as George R. R. Martin was, who in no way should be allegorized to God. We were not looking in the right place. We had shut off our ears. We had shut off our eyes. We had the arrogance to believe that we understood it all. And so just like Oberyn Martell fooled us and claimed his victory even in death, so too did God say, this was never about putting a new king in Israel. This was never about elevating a second-rate power in the national politica, the geonational political world to prominence again. This was about something greater. This was about opening up the possibility that we might be able to defeat evil in the world. And this is the foolishness of preaching that Paul refers to, saying, no, 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 no. You're thinking too small. You're thinking in terms of a nation or in terms of your cynical wisdom. Instead, something greater is going on. And never close your mind to the hope that we might achieve something new that we hadn't thought of yet if only we look in love and enjoy to the possibilities that God sees and not just the possibilities that we see in our limited perspectives. Amen.